the opportunity is best for people have the need and they recognize it and they have the money to pay for it. Okay, <laughs> that, 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 that's, that's the bottom line, okay, where it comes from. But, but I think that the, uh, the great, um, uh, the, the, the new territory, you know, the great uh, uh, unconquered lands are definitely in the, in the enterprise. They're in the individual buildings that are not, attracted to, not attractive to the carriers for a whole bunch of reasons. That, uh, that need this amplification. People, the, you know, the, over the last 10 years, no, seven or eight years, you know, we've already gotten to all the low-hanging fruit. We've already gotten to all, most of the state, all the stadiums. We've gotten to the campuses. We've gotten to uh, large public venues and so forth. And now the, uh, the great uh, frontier is really what we used to call the, the, the great unwashed, and that is the, the underserved marketplace, which is the enterprise. And I think the carriers are shifting s some of their resources to provide for that. Fundamentally, it's going to in the future. It's going to have to be some sort of a uh, sharing of those expenses between the carrier, the, the building owner, and the tenant. I think once we cross the the barrier to where the tenant now uh, the demand is so high, and they see the importance of full bar service, you know, fundamentally very high uh, uploads and download speeds, uh, that they'll be more inclined to uh, add something to their to their monthly rental. Or, or to mm -hmm. cough up some initial money when they when they move in on their on their build out expenses, uh, you know, to, to make all this happen. But there are lots of places that need this, and the, the business models are changing to make that happen, you know, more more, more rapidly. I would agree on the market that that is probably where the biggest opportunity is mm -hmm. that it's the enterprise to getting the tenant to be able to order it themselves uh, if they choose to. Mm -hmm. uh, but I the inter mentioned interesting public safety. I think that's one that actually might help lead the way in terms of uh, acceptance of another spending category. Mm -hmm. Is uh, it's required going forward? Uh, the they should safety. have the funding uh, after these. They're going to fund it. They're, yeah. they're just not going to have a choice. Maybe we need, we have the opportunity to grab that. Look, this you you have to do this. This is a similar system. You're just going to have to have it for other reasons. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the, the fact that we get people exposed to more wireless is, is good in terms of considering new models. Uh, and, but we also often mention Wi-Fi, enterprise Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. To have really high QoS Wi-Fi actually takes quite a bit of work as well. And it uh, mm -hmm. doesn't come for free in terms of installation. And uh, as long as the DAS small cell community acts more as one across all these verticals, Wi-Fi, public safety, small cell, DAS, I think we actually all benefit uh, to help the customer getting more accustomed to a to, um, holistic way of looking at cellular coverage. Okay, okay so I have a two-part answer. So. First of all, I, so we started talking about a little bit of innovation in you know, the DAS space in particular, but there's also innovation going on in the small cell space. And I think um, you know, from that perspective, that's good for the enterprise. So I mean, if we look at where we were six months ago, a year, two years ago, all DAS has basically you know, looked the same or felt the same. They were, you know, there's a certain amount of fiber, there's a certain amount of coax, um, you know, there's head end equipment, there's uh, closet equipment, that, that sort of thing. Now we're looking at it and we have, you know, DASs that are all fiber, you know, all the way with, with active antennas at the endpoints. Um, we have digital DAS, we have, a, you know, a variety of things that are going on in that perspective, that, 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 uh, that equipment. And it's interesting because, you know, when you, when you take something like an all fiber DAS and you go, okay, well, I have fiber, now what do I do with it? Well, you know what, I can hang Wi-Fi off of it. I could do a passive optical network, you know, in conjunction with my DAS, because um, it's all just fiber now. And so, you know, from that perspective, I think we will get into different business models and, and maybe things that the, the enterprise can understand and wrap their arms around because it's not necessarily just a DAS anymore. It's now a enterprise infrastructure. And you can, only, you can look at small cells similarly. Um, you know, if you take Cisco as an example, there's an access point with a 3G plug-in module. Well, you know, probably within, you know, the, say even by the end of the year, there'll be a 4G plug-in module. Now, it's not the easiest thing to deploy yet, but 
It's a, it's a marrying of Wi-Fi and small cell together. So that's from the equipment perspective, but you know, when I look at an enterprise, and I'll just take healthcare as an example. Um, you know, when we sit down, and it's a good thing that this is called HetNet because we can talk about different networks. And when we sit down with the customer and we really say, okay, let's look at wireless holistically. Let's not just look at, you know, do you need a DAS or do you need Wi-Fi? Let's look at this comprehensively. And how are you going to use these networks together? Um, and public safety comes in there as well. But, you know, and I'll give you an example. So, I mean, we did, so, so sitting down with a single customer, a hospital customer that had deployed Wi-Fi. I mean, all hospitals have deployed Wi-Fi to a certain extent. Um, they're running, so in, on those Wi-Fi networks, they're running the guest network, they're running mission critical and life critical applications. Uh, you know, doctors are logging in, nurses are logging in, staff's logging in. These Wi-Fi networks in hospitals are taxed. And I don't care if it's, if you talk about in, if you talk about, you know, 802.11ac, they are taxed. Um, and they're not necessarily the best use for, say, say something like a guest net or something like uh, for a doctor. Because what do people want now? They, people want, you know, this device, um, if I had a six plus, you could probably see it, but um, if you had, if you had, if you, uh, you take this device and you want it to work inside of a building the way it works at your house, on the street, you want that same seamless experience. So when we started asking, when we started asking customers, you know, how, are you, how do you want to use smartphones and in conjunction with Wi-Fi, you start to get answers like, well, it would be really, really good if my doctors didn't have to log onto the Wi-Fi network. Or, you know, we could really improve patient uh, satisfaction if they didn't have to get on the Wi-Fi network that doesn't allow them to go to any of the sites that they want to go to. And so, and we've seen hospitals start to do that and say, you know what, we're going to use Wi-Fi for our mission and life critical applications. We're going to use DAS for our patients, our guests, our physicians who are independent, you know, independent employees anyway. Um, and when you start to have that conversation inside of an enterprise and then do those deployments, all of a sudden you turn around a bad physician satisfaction situation and a bad patient satisfaction situation, and all of a sudden the patient and physician satisfactions in those hospitals goes through the roof positively. And it's simply because now they're getting to use the device that they wanted to use anyway. And so, you know, I think when we start to be able to lay out those kind of case studies in a HetNet environment along with the equipment that's coming out and start to look at these enterprise architectures, I think we will start to have different conversations in the enterprise. Yeah, so Jennifer, in terms of, you know, which vertical is really kind of the, the best place to go, the greatest opportunity, uh, it's interesting because, you know, when we look at those verticals uh, from a JMA wireless perspective, we have uh, projects and installations across all of them. Uh, so all of them are, are really opportunities. Now, um, are some greater than other? I think it's, it's primarily driven by uh, the demand of the end user community that happens to be in those. So when you have environments, I, I, I like to use the example, we see a lot going on in stadiums, uh, large scale stadiums like NFL stadiums. And uh, when uh, we did the project with Levi's Stadium for the San Francisco 49ers, and the, the uh, Levi's team built an application for the stadium so you could view cameras, any, select any camera while you're watching a football game. You can uh, order food and have it delivered to your seat. Now, uh, it, one of their opening season games, Snoop Dogg was on the field and everybody ran down to the field. Now, you can imagine if all those people in the field were trying to capture video of Snoop Dogg while they're in the field and it wasn't working, uh, you'd have a number of fans that weren't very happy. And it's Levi's goal to have a lot of happy fans that want to come back to games. It's a driver from the VP of marketing at the NFL level to drive fan experience. And it just so happens that the type of fans that go to games like to share with their friends that they're at the game. 
So it's a big demand driver. It's, it's a requirement, really, for stadiums to provide that kind of experience these days, which means that those environments uh, are good environments to go into because they have high demand to ensure this kind of connectivity. Uh, most of the stadiums are thinking uh, heterogeneously, so you have Wi-Fi or you have uh, cellular capacity and coverage in those environments, but uh, to the point about heterogeneous networks, the other challenge there is when you roam. Most often people don't want to go in and have to take the time to log into that Wi-Fi network. Right? And you go into many of those environments and what happens when I'm in there and I move from there to another part of the stadium or I move from that stadium to the parking lot. So I would prefer that there's this seamless connectivity without any act on my part. And that's really the benefit of having uh, a fully integrated DAS system from macro all the way into the facility. Uh, so I think those, the, those are some of the factors that really create demand for which verticals. Um, the last thing I'll say on, on public safety, I, I think it's, it, in some ways it's less uh, a vertical than it is a set of capabilities that you want to have available in the different venues. So Levi Stadium, we run public safety uh, over the same DAS system. So they can have their dedicated frequencies for their public safety devices. So uh, I think it's a requirement to have public safety support in many specific venues, um, albeit, yes, public safety could be its own service as well. We've talked, um, you know, all of this is interesting. Then we talk about pro new acronyms to the conversation. <laughs> VOLTE, Voice Over LTE, Wi-Fi, voice over Wi-Fi. How does each new standard or upgrade in the technology affect a DAS or small cell environment? Does it, does it create more complication, more needs for each of your respective businesses to come in and check on it? And therefore, I guess, looking at it from the enterprise side, does it create more sticker shock for them? Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll my first. So the... Um, um, I think at first it's more complicated, and, and mm -hmm. then eventually, as the technologies get accepted and they become more, more, uh, they become more sound and they become more commonplace, then it becomes a lot less, a lot, a lot, a lot less complicated. Uh, you know, you know for sure. Uh, getting back to the to the point that we, we were talking about uh, just just previously, I always you know the, the the DAS was always to me this you know this separate thing that people did, and I included Wi-Fi in the DAS, and I included public safety you know in the DAS side because that was uh, wireless communications. And I think as time goes on, you'll see that especially with passive optical networks, that in fact the DAS could become the network, or the DAS is indistinguishable in the network of the, of the entire building. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's not like here's the DAS and here's the thing. You put you put an all fiber DAS in a, in a passive optical network, and you know you can't you, you know t you can't see the difference right. in, in a sense, right? So uh, I think that's really an important concept that that all this is married to. There's con the convergence of these things. So it's just not you have to just go pay for a DAS. You put in a network that just happens to have Wi-Fi, DAS, public safety, and search security, and a whole bunch of other things. All the other things in it. And that's what these gentlemen are talking about in these stadiums. They have they have they have massive networks, and they don't have a network for every one of these applications. It's pretty much the same network with a, with a lot of applications hang, hanging off of it. And that's I think that's what fiber probably does for you in passive and the you know high speed uh, passive optical networks do for you uh, as far as the other technologies they'll they'll be integrated i think they're more they're more complicated at the beginning but the, I'm, I'm sure they'll save save time and money uh, you know over the long run uh, from a t connectivity perspective <clears throat> we were this is an area that we were quite sensitive as we were developing more recent generations of products is, to leverage the fact that DAS has a centralized point of interface or so contact to the where, where the operator comes to, to the premise, uh, and as long as not too many new spectral components are added that are used, DAS does provide a degree of upgradability if the system is uh, is uh, thoughtfully designed up front and gives certain advantages to equivalent uh, deployments that if it individual small cells that may have to be maintained on an individual basis. So I think uh, uh, DAS in some embodiments uh, can provide a good degree of future proofing 
as some of these new services and new variants uh, come online. So not like a rip and replace? When else uh, we, we are of the belief that you can deal with, with the right choices up front, right. uh, provided by, by the OEM that uh, we can delay that rip and replace okay. cycle and make it a, a add-on if needed or if wanted uh, uh, for a longer period of time. Yeah, yeah I think, uh, so if history, or let's see, we'll see if history repeats itself, um, because I, you know, I think Paula brought up the fact that, you know, if, if, the, if a DAS is, say, five years old now, I mean, we're in a normal technology refresh cycle from that perspective, um, and the requirements today versus what they were five years ago are, are dramatically different. Um, and you're lucky if maybe, maybe the only thing in a, in a five-year-old system today would be the, the coax, I mean, sorry, the, uh, uh, the conduit. Um, that might be the only thing that's salvageable uh, because it would be a, uh, you know, if we looked at it today, it would be a brand new design, much more rigor in that design, you know, voice versus data uh, type discussion. I think today we're a lot smarter um, than we were five years ago. And so I, I do think that we are, you know, getting to the point where there can be some longevity, um, you know, as you mentioned that, uh, because we are, we are understanding that there is going to be more f spectrum um, as an example. And so we can start to plan for that uh, ahead of time and build equipment that uh, can handle, you know, plug-in modules or, or, or that sort of thing. But, you know, when you bring up things like voice over LTE or uh, those types of technologies, you know, they're brand new. Um, and so we know how to do a DAS that um, can do uh, voice over UMTS as an example um, and handle data as well. Now when we start to, to uh, push voice over LTE, which is just more data um, onto that same network, uh, there may be changes required. Um, in fact, I think I, every chance I get I ask that question of what kind of changes are going to be required. Um, and I think we just don't know yet. Um, I think we know that, you know, uh, signal levels are going to get hotter and hotter, um, that we are going to need more uh, capable base stations or remote radio heads or, or whatever um, to drive the DAS. Uh, but chances are we will be tweaking systems um, as things like voice over LTE rolls out and we learn, okay, this is really what it means to roll those kind of things out and, you know, we'll go through some, some tweaks. I don't see that it would be a rip and replace in the, like, if we could fast forward five years from now, I can't, I don't think we will be in a rip, in a rip and replace situation, but you know what, there's so much innovation, so it may not just be the application, it may be these infrastructure uh, architectures that go, you know what, it, it is a DAS and it is a PON, it is an Ethernet and it is all of these things and I'm deploying a new network, not because I, want, I needed to rip, rip and replace my DAS, but I can get all of these other things now. And so that might be the discussion five years from now. Okay. Um, I, I guess, <clears throat> so the space shuttle wasn't an upgrade to an Apollo rocket. <laughs> so it was a, pretty much a rip and replace. But uh, over a long period of time and a, and a significant uh, difference in functionality uh, that it provided. So, um, I, you know, at JMA Wireless, one of the things we, we focus a lot on as we innovated the DAS gear is to ensure that we have modularity in the design so that as some of the new technologies and the new services that the carriers want to deliver into these venues uh, over these different bands of spectrum they have, uh, that we can shift or we can, we can change out the modules and reutilize uh, the fiber that's in place, we utilize some of the antenna technology that's in place. So there is uh, a good foundation of core technology that can be reused. And uh, if you look at every step along the way, from the time that energy comes out of an antenna all the way back to, you know, where it's coming back into the core infrastructure, uh, and then you think of Volte, where we're now talking about going to 100% data to your device and including your voice call, uh, there is an evolution of capabilities all along that path that will evolve. 
Uh, we believe there's a bunch of equipment in that path when it comes to the DAF systems that are going to be very upgradable, if you will. They're going to support the ability to um, migrate to that stage. So uh, I think it, it, in terms of this, it's um, number one, when you start the process, it's all about ensuring the original design is right. Uh, because I'll be honest with you, we have rip and replaces going on where uh, just the, the original equipment that was put in was never really designed to be able to supply that kind of venue, the service it, it needed. And as a result, they had to reinvest into an entirely different system. Uh, and that had nothing to do with age. It's this stuff is 12 months old. So uh, I think you've got to be cautious on the very front end to make sure that it's thoughtful in terms of the design for the environment and the venue you want to go into uh, to make sure that you have the right solution in the first place and then forecast and work with your vendors and integrators, operators on how that will evolve with their services over time. Um, if you look, one of the discussion points we were having yesterday um, with one of my contacts is this, if you look at the carrier spending out in the outer years, next call it three to five years, you know, ca CapEx or capital expenditures has been on a constant rise despite my models calling for a decline. We've not seen that. But with everything you're talking about, do you see the capital spending shifting more from CapEx that they're laying out to more higher operating costs or OpEx as we call it? I mean, is this, is this a, a, a layer of costs the carriers have still yet to see as we roll out more DAS, small cell, what, whatever? I'm not sure of the question. Um, like, do you see the spending from a capital standpoint continuing to be high, or has it become more of a, um, that they're paying the independent, call it, you know, the extranets of the world, or pick your dad's provider, more of that operating cost, or the tower companies? Well, there's only so many stadiums. Right. And there's only so many, you know, really, really large public venues. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I don't know the answer to the question, but it would seem to me that the CapEx, that if I had a bet the capex would cap itself at some point okay. and then the operating expenses would, uh, you know, would, would be more. Would be more. Yeah. And to your point, since there's a limited number of large venues and if most of those are uh, occupied by the neutral host uh, companies that, so to speak, own the rights to the site, uh, in some sense the benefit of the carrier is that they can cap their capex right. and, uh, and uh, shift all of the expenses to, to an OPEX model right. and that seems to be something that is currently in favor. Got it. And I think for the big venues, uh, such a banking, intermediate banking vehicles is, is probably a, a successful model because it does provide a neutral entity that can bring and leverage, bring multiple parties together and together. leverage the initial investment. Right. Because like what Paula was saying, she doesn't have many solo mm -hmm. systems, but if, if that is the case, then the, the ROI is very difficult one to but, make. But what we're saying here seems to be logical to me, so you know that's not going to happen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Kevin, do you have any? Yeah, so I think we, you know, we're, we're on a similar trend to what's happened at the outdoor DAS, and so I do think carrier spend will decline over time, and the 3PO uh, spend will increase, um, and so will the enterprise spend. You know, but I don't think we're, I don't think we're done because I think, um, you know, so, uh, you know, I, I go to a, a college football stadium every year, season ticket holders, and I've been going there for five years, and I'm st still waiting for, I'm praying one day um, that the system will actually work. Um, <laughs> because, and the problem, you know, it's, the problem is, is that there's just too many devices, and it doesn't matter how many sectors we create, it's still hard. Um, and I don't think we've reached the point of figuring all of that out yet. But, but 